morning, everyone, and welcome to Centers for Spiritual Living White Rock. I'm Tamara Rossander, the spiritual director here right at the moment, and we are an inclusive learning center where our vision here is that the world will express love naturally. I'm um, excited today that we are going to be opening up our morning gathering with a new musician, talented artist, Marley Wolchuk. Marley is a multi-award winning singer, actress, songwriter, musician, voiceover, and recording artist. She's also a painter, and she is right from Vancouver, British Columbia. And after years of singing on commercials, TV guest appearances in live theaters and bands and having a national hit song and touring in three CDs, Marley has ventured into film and TV. So she can be seen ja um, acting opposite of Jessica Biel in Limetown as Jessie, Tyler Ferguson's mom in the upcoming Ivy and Bean. And she's also, as you can see her as Cora in The Bad Seed Returns. And she also guest stars in season four of Creep, of Creep Show. I haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> but, and yeah, she's one of the laughing women in that Poise commercial. <laughs> Good. And she currently sings um, with a popular dance and RB band, Sold Out. So please welcome our new first time musician here with us, Marley Walchuk. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I thought I'd start with an original song for today. Every day is like the last. Time slips by so fast when nothing happens. Mm -hmm. We're just dragged along, feeling something is wrong. Trying to fill the gaps in with crap we don't need. You call that free. What's the purpose? Where's the meaning? Can happiness sustain or is it always fleeting? If life's too short, let's pull it together. You grab one end and I'll take the other. Let's get out of here, find a place where we can breathe. Do what we love, stop building someone else's dream. Run with me. Run with me. Yeah, yeah. You're more tired every day. Hate to see you this way. It's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. We could live with much less. Check the phone, lose the stress. Internet, turf it. I'm on there half a day. What's left to say? I got 300 people confirmed as friends. Would he put one show if I needed them? To hear lies. Too short, let's pull it together. You clap one end and I'll take the other. Let's get out of here, find a place where we can breathe. Do what we love, stop building someone else's dream. Run with me. Run with me. I want to feel the wind in my hair, your arms around me there. Let's crash on the grass and take in the open sky. Worry about nothing at all, just let the markets fall. I'm only invested in bringing back your smile. Give life too short, let's pull it together. You grab one end and I'll take the other. Let's get out of here, find a place where we can't breathe. Do what we love, stop building someone else's dream. Run with me. Run with me. Yeah, yeah. Run with me. Oh, run with me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Wow. Amazing.
amazing. I definitely will run along with you. Life is can be too short. That is awesome, Marley. Thank you. That um, and if you um, don't mind, put your contact information in the chat so that our listeners can enjoy some of your other further music and see where you're playing or where you're watching. I think do you sell also some of your art or something? I think as well was it did you marley or don't it's all on the website so i'll put my it's website. All on the website okay so yeah maybe if you can put that in that would be great thank you, thank you. excellent thank well you. As, as we begin our gathering today and as settlers on this land we're honored to live and operate on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the coast salish peoples we want to thank the First Peoples who continue to live on these lands and to care for them. And they also care for the waters and all that is above and all that is below. And I commit to walking softly on this land to walk with them on taking care of it. And as CSL White Rock is an inclusive spiritual community and learning center, we teach spiritual principles and offer tools to use in all areas of our life. And when we use them regularly and consistently, that's when shifts happen. Our life then flourishes and flows out of ease and grace. So let's walk together on this path and walk each other home, all the while transforming our lives as well as the lives of others. So I want to thank you again for being here with us today. Well, today we're so fortunate to welcome back Reverend Savannah Noel. She is an inspirational speaker. She was started her young life at Mile High <clears throat> Church in Colorado and was one of our very first youngest ministers for our organization. But as she's gone through, she's now served as staff minister and she continues to speak globally and in the United States and lead, retreat, uh, lead <laughs> retreats and teach. At her passion and work in this global ministry has nourished her soul and Rev Savannah shares her wisdom and knowledge on social media. So make sure to, that you follow her and find out what she's up to on Facebook and Instagram. And right now, Reverend Savannah is residing in not too far from us down in Seattle, Washington. So we're so pleased to have Reverend Savannah Noel back with us. Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, love me some Joni Mitchell. <laughs> I uh, that song. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Uh, you know how you hear a song and it takes you back to a moment in time in your life uh, that was precious to you. And that song is one of those. So thank you, Marley, so much for uh, bringing that into my world this morning and all of us. And then I had this thought as she was singing uh, why I love this community so much. It's been a minute. You know, I haven't been with you all for. I don't know how many months now, but what I find uh, in all my speaking with different communities is they take on their own uh, culture, their own vibe, their own energy. And what I love about this community is how heart-centered you are because I could cry in a moment's notice <laughs> because of just the energy that is so palpable from all of you. So thank you so much for having me back. I'm, I'm really grateful. So today's talk is all about who's taking out the trash. <laughs> Who is taking out the trash? <clears throat> so I lived in this spiritual community. Uh, some of you might have heard of it many, many years ago. I want to say it was probably eight years ago now called Launching Pad. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it uh, used to be a Centers for Spiritual Living young adult community in the Bay Area in Berkeley. And Reverend Linda Rapond uh, decided to start this uh, young adult spiritual community. It was one of the first of this kind uh, ever in our organization. And we all lived in a really big house and there were about eight of us and it was a ministry. And I was out of a a really horrible breakup. I had moved my life from the Middle East back to the States and 
I didn't know what was next for me. I had just finished ministerial school and I remember a room opening up in this home and they asked me if I wanted to move in. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I am too old for this, um, it, you know, communal living situation with all these young adults. But then I realized very quickly after arriving that it was the place I needed to land. It was my launching pad, right, um, for that time period. And we all had our assignments and chores and, you know, certain duties that we would all perform in, you know, the home to make sure, you know, we're doing our, our part. And it was Walter's job, Reverend Linda's husband, uh, to take out the trash. It was his responsibility. And I remember none of us wanted to do it, but he prided himself in it. He had it programmed on the days uh, in his phone of when to bring them in and bring, and bring them out. And then after a while at the launching pad, I remember my first ministry job. And they told us in school that a minister, sometimes in smaller communities, when you're building the community, we will basically do everything. Now, there's a lot they don't tell you in school that you kind of just learn on the job, you know, but they said, if you went into ministry for the money, you're, you're probably in the wrong profession, which I still question to this day, because I'm like, we teach abundance principles, right? Um, but we do it all. There is like this uh, expectation in many communities that we are the visionary, we are the administrator, the business entrepreneur, we are the youth program developer, we're the community outreach person, we're the pastoral care support, and yes, the toilet cleaner. And I know Tamara could probably relate to this, <laughs> having been in this, you know, uh, position, it's like, uh, what do we not do? Which is why volunteers are so essential in any spiritual community. But we're also the ones sometimes to take out the garbage. And at some point in my first ministry, I remember uh, I thought to myself, this is not my job. So who's taking out the trash? And so as I was thinking of this concept, uh, it dawned on me that, you know, there's been great value in asking this question for a number of reasons. I think that it offers us the possibility and the insight of greater humility uh, our thoughts on service and giving and what service means to us. It offers us something that I have been discovering over the last few months, which I've heard before, but it never really um, related to me until I've been going through it, which is, you know, how usually it happens, right? Which is ego death. This loss of self-importance. It's that stripping away of this self-created identity that makes us think that we have made it to some destination of our own making, when in, when in reality, it, an ego death shakes us to our core of what is really real. And so when we ask this question, um, it allows us to look at our own feelings of our identity and our self-importance. It also asks us to take inventory of the things that we might be carrying around, the things that we are still holding on to. Something that over the last few months I've been realizing, um, because I've been going through a lot of change. I don't, I haven't been able to connect with all of you, um, very, you know, in a while, and I've been going through a lot of transition and change, a lot of um, soul searching of what are my next steps, uh, what does my ministry entail, you know, all the questions we have of the uncertainties of of what do we do now, right? And what I'm realizing is that there is value in doing the things that no one wants to do. There is great value in it. And how this has shown up for me is um, with something that I, th I think I had bias around and I didn't fully realize it until I felt like this carpet had been pulled out from underneath me. When I left Amazing Grace Spiritual Center in January, there was, of course, grief and loss and uncertainty. <clears throat> And what came with that, interestingly, was my ability to continue to aspire for more. I was like, okay, so when one door closes, one another one opens. You know, we always talk about this, that, that um, can you look at the things that look like potential loss and, and, and hardships and see that it was actually for me and not against me? And it's taken me a while to see that, uh, you know. Uh, Mariah Mountain Dreamer talks about in her book, The Invitation, 
where she says, I want to know you can stand in the fire with me and not shrink back and do what it takes to feed the children. And in my case, it was do what it takes to not compromise my dreams and at the same time, feed myself. And in doing it, you know, in doing so, there were many moments um, that really brought me to my knees of this place of complete surrender, of questioning everything I've ever been taught, everything I've ever known, everything I've ever taught to people. And so it's, it was this place of surrender of, okay, what are my next steps? And I'm sure many of you can relate to this feeling of, okay, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know where I'm going next. And what, what now, God, what, what do I do now? When we don't know what to do, we stop, we pray, we call a friend, we surrender, and we do it again and again. And in my case, I was literally on my knees. And what was really beautiful is some amazing things, of course, happened out of it, because I believe there is always that silver lining. There's always that spark. There's always something that, again, is aspiring for us to want to be more. It's uh, what uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith calls um, living in the let go. He says we have to live in the let go and out of no way, a way is made and it is shown and it is revealed to us. Now, my problem was, is I wanted it revealed to me like yesterday. <laughs> I wanted it now and it wasn't showing up in the now as I wanted it. And so what it did for me is it pushed me into this area of working. I was working, I think at one point, four jobs, four jobs. And I was working jobs that I chose to experience because it was out of this old paradigm that I'd been in for so many years and of, of needing to be in some safe, secure job space that kept me small. And what happened was because I chose something totally different, I chose to work in the restaurant industry, which I've never done in my life. It launched me completely out of my comfort zone. And, and somehow I felt like it was below me. It was, I felt that somehow below me because I had worked my way through ministry to get to a certain place. We've worked our way to a certain place in life. And then we, we, something knocks us off, right? I took a lower paying job, uh, giving my chance, myself a chance to do something different that I'd never tried before. And there was that feeling of, well, what if I fail? I might struggle. And I did struggle. And my dreams, I thought, took a back seat. My faith uh, has been challenged in ways uh, that are hard to articulate deeply by this type of transition. And so I want you for a moment, because I know that I'm not alone here, and I want you to just think back uh, for a second at a time in your life, and you might be going through it now, when you felt completely hopeless, when you had no hope, when the situation was just so difficult. And I want you to just uh, bring it to your mind just for a moment. And what was it? What was that thing that catapulted you out of it? What was the thing that pulled you towards your vision? You know, they taught, you know, Michael Beckwith always says this, the pain pushes till the vision pulls. And I'm like, okay, vision, <laughs> keep pulling, right? What was that thing that, that had you believing again? Faith, I believe is easy. When things are going really well, when things feel like they've come together, it's easy to have faith, but it is in those moments of silent introspection, when we wonder how we're going to pay the electricity bill or the rent, if that dream that we have is going to come to fruition, if our children are going to live out their lives happy now that we've raised them, how the medical bills are going to be covered, if we've lived a good enough life that we feel that we fulfilled some sort of legacy if we will ever find that lifelong partner that we long for, if it all had meaning, I know I'm not the only one wondering these things. Ernest Holmes reminds us again and again about prayer. He talks about prayer and our movement of prayer. When he says, when prayer removes distrust and doubt and enters the field of mental certainty, it becomes faith and the universe is built on faith. But sometimes I find we have to fake it till we make it because, you know, words don't always align with feeling. <laughs> but what would we be without hope? 
what would we be without hope? When we feel hopeless, I, I find that one of the best ways to counter that is to do something. It's to take out the trash. It's to volunteer. It is to support a friend or cook a meal for someone. It's service that is that is the thing that connects us to humanity. You know, you have a vision in this community of love being the norm, of love being the natural order of things, right? And that's just part of that's part of who we are. And service, it's the same way. It reconnects us to humanity and to the joys of giving. It takes us out of our identification with our pain and our self-indulgence in our suffering. Because I find that sometimes we become addicted to our pain. We become addicted to our story around suffering. And what's so beautiful about our teaching is that it, it has a way of pulling us out of it if we work with it. Former President Obama wrote a book you probably remember called The Audacity of Hope. And in this book, he talks about hope and he says, I'm not talking about blind optimism, the kind of hope that just ignores the enormity of the tasks ahead or the roadblocks that stand in our path. I'm not talking about the wishful idealism that allows us to just sit on the sidelines or shirk from a fight. I'm, I have always believed that hope is that stubborn thing inside us that insists despite all the evidence to the contrary, that something better awaits us as long as we have the courage to keep reaching, to keep working, to keep fighting. So in all honesty, it was not below me. That lower paying restaurant job, it humbled me. It gave me perspectives um, that I could not have known otherwise, and I will never look at a restaurant the same way again. I made great friends as well there. It's like that undercover boss TV show where the boss goes in to hear his employees and what they feel and experience to get the reality of what they might be missing. I felt like I was having that experience of something that um, I had never known before until I put myself in the situation. You know, the curtain and the veil came open. And that theme of self-importance and purpose also came crumbling down with it. And what came with that? The real, the real with a capital R. So can we look at, the question I would ask you is, can, can you look at the value that you've received from every experience, most especially the ones that you don't wanna do, the things you don't wanna do, the things that you don't enjoy from every single circumstance, can we find that pearl and that value of, and see how it's shaping us? You know, the choice is ours to do everything we're doing from a place of gratitude and joy. So looking at the quote unquote trash in your life that doesn't work for you anymore, what is the trash that needs to go out? Is it a belief? Is it a situation? Is it an unforgiveness? or maybe your own self-doubt, maybe it's a way of doing things or some resentment that you're holding on to. What I know is I've got to clean up my side of the street. My only job, my only job, and I think that our only job really is to be true to that inner knower within ourselves. That is my only job is to be true to that inner knower. Someone said to me recently, um, they said, Savannah, the obstacle is the way. And I'm like, no, it's not <laughs> like the obstacle is the way. And I think that this speaks to looking at our shame, our fears, our challenges right in the face and saying, you have no power over me. I will do what I must do as an invitation to know myself deeper. Everything, everything that is in my life right now, everything that is in your life right now was not uninvited. That is like something to really take in, that everything that is in my life was not uninvited. At the total risk of vulnerability and exposure and ego death, I commit to knowing myself and my nature more deeply. To me, that is the task of all of this. Brene Brown, I think, actually said it best. I love her, her work. She said, when I see people stand fully in their truth, and when I see someone fall down, get back up and say, damn, that really hurt, but this is important to me, and I'm going to do it again, my gut reaction is, what a badass. Yeah, I feel that. <laughs> like, 
when I see that in someone else, because I can relate and I know you can relate when you've fallen down and you see someone go at it and at it and then they make it. Another example of this uh, is from one of my favorite artists, musicians, uh, singer songwriter, uh, Alanis Morissette. You may not know this about her, but I was reading a bit about her Jagged Little Pill um, album and her tour because I saw her last year here. She was doing her 25th anniversary of it. And she was saying that she spent over a year touring and promoting uh, the 1995 album, Jagged Little Pill, and it burned her out physically and emotionally. And so for that next year and a half, she took a lot of time off to decompress and reevaluate which I thought, wow, what a concept, you know, we work so hard at doing something and how often do we actually allow ourselves time <laughs> to just be and to reevaluate and to decompress. And so what came out of that experience for her was the song, which I'm sure you probably know. And if you don't, you should go, go YouTube it. It's called Thank You. And Thank You is her reaction to what she says, her conflicted feelings that she had after achieving so much success. And part of the lyrics are, I think she went to India, you know, during that time. She says, thank you, India. Thank you, terror. Thank you, disillusionment. Thank you, frailty. Thank you, consequence. Thank you, clarity. Thank you, silence. And she says, thank you. I don't even know how many times in the song, but it is so beautiful. And she, she explains in her VH1 a storyteller's experience and appearance that she says, I felt like that I lived in a culture that told me that I had to consistently and constantly look outside of myself to feel this elusive bliss. And I achieved a lot of what society has told me to achieve and I still didn't feel peaceful. So I started questioning everything and I realized that actually everything was an illusion. And it was scary for me because everything that I believed in was dissolving in front of me and there was a death of sorts a really beautiful one ultimately, but at first a very scary one. And so I stopped. I stopped for the first time and I was overcome with a huge sense of compassion for myself first. And then naturally that translated into my feeling and compassion for everyone around me and a huge amount of gratitude that I had never felt before to this extent. And that's why I had to write this song, Thank You, because I had to express how exciting this was and how scary it was and all of these opportunities for us to define who we are. And if you watch the video, I remember when it came out, everyone on MTV was like going crazy because she's naked in the video and her hair covers up, you know, all of the essential parts. But she says, I was thinking about the song and its simplicity and it's bearing itself. And she said, I just thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I could just walk around New York City or grocery stores and just a symbolism of being naked everywhere I went? So less about overt sexuality and more about uh, the symbolism of being really raw and naked and intimate in all of those environments that you'd seemingly need protection. She said, you know, like in the subway and those kinds of places. And so they executed it right after she had this idea. And I love this because, again, it's another example of an ego death, of humility, of stripping away the layers of unworthiness, of self-doubt, of fear, of anger, of self-sabotage, of getting really to the real naked you, the real you. We can look at uh, taking out the trash, I think, as a gift to ourselves and to other people. It's part of our service and our commitment to growth, to an organization, to working on these fundamental you know, parts of ourselves, to shedding these layers of unworthiness and pain. And so the question that I, I will leave you with is, what if it was all for you and not against you? So next time you take out the trash, you might consider what it is that you wanna throw, throw in with it. Where can you practice stepping more boldly into doing the things you do not want to do with joy, with patience for the process, and with faith? And when you forget who you are, when you've lost some sense of hope, when you're in a place of challenge, I want to offer you this antidote. And I have this also in my wallet. I want you to carry around a small sheet of paper with you in your wallet that has written on it the names of people whose opinion matters to you the most. W what that means is to be on this list, you have to love me for my strengths and for my struggles. So who's going to be on that list? 
And when you forget, you take out that list and you look at it. Who is taking out the trash? Let us go into a prayer now. <clears throat> Just taking that holy moment <sighs> to give gratitude, to give gratitude for it all. All of the challenge, all of the struggle, all of the joys, all of the beauties of life, all of the change and transition. What I know is that right in the midst of all of it is this power and presence of love itself, this wisdom, this intelligence of that inner knower that lives in each and every one of us. It is that thing that we come back to when we're on our knees of surrender. It is that thing that lives within us that has never been hurt or harmed or betrayed. It is the power and the presence of love itself. It is God, it is intelligence, it is the knower. And so what I'm knowing in this moment for myself and for this entire community is that we awaken to the remembrance of who and whose we are in every moment, despite the challenge and the conditions. And that we let go of the things that no longer serve. That we come back to the real, real, real. <laughs> the real with a capital R, that connection to the spirit that lives within each and every one of us that allows us to create and to transform and to heal in every moment because it is possible. It is possible to transform anything, anything in our experience because I know that everything has come into my experience, not uninvited. And so with that, I give gratitude. I give gratitude for this community, for the many ways that we continue to share and to grow and to love one another. And I know that that ripples out into the world a hundred times fold. And so we just give thanks, we give gratitude, and I let this be so. And together we say ashe. And so it is. Namaste. So this next section of our gathering today, what I'd like to talk to you about is gratitude. And Reverend Savannah talked about gratitude in, in her, her talk in The Surrender. But gratitude is a rich and nourishing experience. So if you're grateful for this experience that you've had today of sharing community, meditate through the, the lecture, through meditation, and the music that uplifts you and our consciousness, please feel free to donate to CSL White Rock. And you can donate on our website. Um, if giving online doesn't work for you, you can also mail us a check or send us an e-transfer. So we'll be putting all that information in the chat so you can take a look at the best way to donate with CSL White Rock and in gratitude. So what I'd like to ask you now is to join me in declaring our prosperity affirmation. And that is the divine love within blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. <laughs>